This is a GK Media Podcast. Today is a very strange day for me. As I record this introduction for this special episode of Gary Talks, the funeral of a musician I have admired for many decades, Johnny Doohan, will take place later. I began my radio career in 2007, and in 2010, I launched my first podcast, Organics Music, which was a monthly 60-minute show promoting contemporary Irish music. And each episode featured a selection of songs by Irish artists and included a one-on-one interview. That year, I produced 12 episodes, and one of the highlights for me was sitting down to interview the great Johnny Doohan. Over the years, I had the honour of working alongside legends of the Irish music industry, including Des Kelly, Johnny Cummins and Jimmy Higgins, all of whom had immense respect and admiration for Johnny Doohan. For Johnny to agree to appear on my podcast was a huge win for me. And one of the things I admired most about Johnny was his dedication to Irish music. Like me, he felt there wasn't enough genuine support for Irish music or Irish musicians on our national and local airwaves. I have to be honest, it's a bit cringeworthy listening back to this interview, which I recorded over 14 years ago when I was just starting out in radio and still developing my skills as an interviewer. I certainly don't like listening back to my voice and how I conducted interviews back then but I want to share it for those of you like me who have loved Johnny and his music over the years. This is an opportunity I guess to hear Johnny in his own words sharing his life and his wonderful stories. Listening to it now knowing that Johnny is no longer with us is quite emotional but it's a blessing to have this recording to remember him by. Johnny Doohan, thank you for everything you gave us. You will be deeply missed, but beautifully remembered. Welcome back. That's a song called To The Light from Johnny Doohan from what is now a collector's item album called Don Quixote. But of course, there's also the album, the extended album that Johnny released uh, later called To The Light. And I'm delighted because, you know, earlier on we were telling you that our special guest on this podcast is Johnny Doohan. And over the years working in media, uh, whether it be film, TV or radio, there's always certain people that you really look forward to meeting. And I'm delighted that Johnny Doohan joins us in Studio 2 of Goi FM this afternoon. Johnny, you're very welcome. Well, thanks for inviting me in. Well, Sorry. it's an absolute pleasure to have you, and I can't emphasize that enough. It's one of those things, where do we start? But I think we start from, you know, the early days. You're based now in Galway, but you grew up in Limerick. Uh, so can you tell us about growing up in Limerick, what those days were like in Ireland, and I suppose with your father being away at sea a lot as well? Well, Limerick was a fairly impoverished place at that stage, but not as bad as it was in Frank McCourt's days. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I grew up very close to where he grew up. Uh, up. He grew up in the little laneways off the street where I grew up. And I feature Limerick very much in the first chapter of a book I brought out last year called To the Light, uh, Just Another Town. And uh, all the songs are about all the characters and all the situations that impressed me most growing up and and mainly I was drawn towards the river because my father was a a sailor and I used to spend all my time down on the banks of the Shannon. There was a docks down there and I I spent a lot of time down there. Many ships would come in and it was a fascinating place to be. You'd hear all these different languages from the different sailors. Uh, It's completely changed now. There's very few ships come in there, you know, the occasional one. Was the poverty as bad in Limerick as Frank McCourt made out in the book? Uh, well, that was way before my time, so yeah. I, I'm sure it was. It was the same way all over Ireland mm. at that time, you know. I mean, there was the very poor and then the fairly wealthy, They, all, you know. I mean, there was the Great Divide has always existed. And it was probably very common as well back then for the father of the family to be away, being the breadwinner as such. Well, that's it. 
my father was a merchant seaman uh, and a lot of men around the streets were similarly, you know. I remember there were, there were five pubs in our street, you know. <laughs> uh, talk about head shops. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> but uh, a lot of the pubs were inhabited by, you know, the clientele was mainly old sailors, old sea dogs. And I used to love going into them. Uh, my father used to take me and he, and he mainly went there to sing because, uh, you know, that was the main form of entertainment then, and he loved singing. So any time he went into any of the bars, he'd be asked to give a song, and he'd stand up and without any microphone or instrument, just fire it out. And is that where your admiration of music came from? You could see the reaction that he would have been getting from people. Well, some of, some of it. Uh, what I try to do in Just Another Town is capture all the musical influence of that time. In other words, there were a lot of brass bands playing. There was a brass band up at the top of the street. Uh, and in fact, a relation of mine on my mother's side started the, the band, uh, the Boher Bai band. And I used to love listening to the, the, the band's practice. And, and then they'd go on their marches around the town. And, uh, and I similarly loved all the songs that you'd hear in the bars, men singing, you know, kind of ballads and mm. Songs that are long forgotten now. You might hear them <clears throat> occasionally in Des Kelly's program yeah. of a morning, you know. Uh, and I still love them, you know. I still love listening to the very melodic, some of the songs. Uh, so I tried to capture the whole soundscape of Limerick uh, while I was growing up in the songs of uh, Just Another Town. Some of them would have come from the radio influences, you know, the, the beginnings of rock and roll or the beginnings of Calypso or whatever, you mm. know. They would seep into the lives, and so the, all them sorts of influences go in. There's very little actual influence of rock music as such in that album. The the one that follows it, in fact, is To the Light itself, mm. it's chapter two, and uh, then that was me going into the the rock area in life. Uh, I heard, you know, people like Ray Charles and Motown music. Mm. We were probably the first band group of musicians that uh, were doing Motown and, and soul music here in Ireland. Back in 1964, I think we started off. Uh, I was only 14 or thereabouts. We used to practice down in Guido Di Vito's Cafe, an Italian. <laughs> we, our drummer was Italian. And uh, we used to practice down in the basement where they used to do the peeling of the spuds. You know? All right. <laughs> they had an electric one, you know, which... Used to compete with it for the sound, you know. It was a very rough situation, but it was it was grand. And then Granny's intentions as well. That was formed was well, it in they, the late sixties. Well, we started off as the intentions because right. we were kind of based roughly on, on the Temptations and bands like that. Yes. So you, you even copied the names, you know. But then later, when we moved to London, right in the middle of the sixties, it would have been at the time when the Beatles were bringing out Sgt. Pepper and all that. Uh, we changed the name. I, I can't remember how it, the grannies came in. I think it might have been something to do with the mothers of invention and grannies intention, you know, or s something like that. I'm not quite sure. You moved to London. London would have been a very different place as it is nowadays for the Irish. Well, we were very lucky when we arrived there because uh, we'd already become very popular in Dublin. And we had to because it was either that or starve, you know. We turned professional at 16. I remember my father didn't speak to me for a year uh, because of it. You know, we just up and went, and it was pretty tough for the first six months or so. So out of desperation, we kind of forced our way to the top of the... So we were probably the top band in Ireland at that stage, along with people like Rory Gallagher and Skid Row and... But going back to why your father didn't speak to you, was that because you... Oh, because I became a musician in a band. He thought it was a mugs game, as he called oh. it. And, you know, it was very, very insecure business. It still is, you know. I mean, my heart goes out to all, all the young people that are trying to forge a way in music. Now, were you pursuing a different line of education at the time? Uh, no. Well, most of the band were still in school. Uh, in fact, I'd been kicked out of school, I think. <laughs> 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 because um, I had to run in with the brothers, but uh, the story uh, with the brothers was this something where you stood up for someone else? Oh, uh, well, I, I that happened. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, it's just uh, and, and you had to get the wrath of it. Huh? You faced the wrath. I think a lot of people that happened to you know. I mean, there were some of the brothers were very cruel, and uh, you just couldn't sit by and let them 
you know, take it out on people that didn't deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, moving to London for the band was, was colossal. It was right in the heart of the 60s, you know, and uh, Flower Power was beginning to to blossom and bloom. And uh, I remember we moved into a hotel in Sussex Gardens. There were all sorts of bands there, like Led Zeppelin and Joe Cocker and people like that. A lot of them would be sneaking out without trying to get out without paying and things <laughs> they didn't, couldn't afford. You know, all the bands there. Mm -hmm. You had bands, up and coming bands, and then bands at the at the other end, you know, the old Teddy Boy bands, you know, with the quiffs and the. Yeah, they still, and they'd be on their way out, the, the, the real rock and rollers. It was a, an interesting place to stay, you know, run by an Irish woman. And uh, she, she used to tell us <laughs> that she had terrible gripe about all these bands. I think it was uh, Jimmy Page got out a win back window one time. And uh, without, probably didn't have the money, you know. <laughs> the only reason bands stay there was because they had a late breakfast concession. <laughs> yeah, you could Excellent. have breakfast there until 12. <laughs> and at the end of the breakfast then, the, the girls serving were very nice. They'd serve you up extra sausages so that you could make your lunch as well, you know, with the leftover bread. And yeah. So all the bands were at that, you know, the... One of the things is, and I know you mentioned Des Kelly earlier, and, you know, the, the various musicians that I've met over the years as well, and those working in the industries, they always have huge praise for you and huge respect for you. You know, sometimes you might hear someone having a gripe about someone else, but I've never heard anyone say a bad word about you. I'm sure you'll find them. <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing as well that amazes some people is you never fell into the category of the fame seeker. No, I... But I'm not, I wouldn't be that interested. Of course, you want your work to reach a fairly la large audience, you know. Uh, but I've I've seen too many people on the way on the road. You know, I lived with um, Gary Moore and uh, Phil Linnett for a number of years, and I remember Phil. He used to be this terrific fellow. He was really bright and you know full of life. Then I met him. We lived together in Black or out in Donnybrook. We had shared a flat for about nine months, I think. And uh, then I moved to London, and then he moved to London when we came back. And uh, I met him a few years later, and he was totally changed. You know, it was the the lifestyle had kind of got to him, or the madness of the whole situation. But you would never meet a, a lovelier person than he was, like in, mm. the, in when he was starting out. Gary Moore was the same, lovely fellow. Still is. Mm. I haven't met him in years. Would there have been people who you would have been great friends with for certain periods of your life who I suppose you've kind of... Oh, the happens. connection has been lost. Oh, that happens all the time. With Gary in particular. Now, I remember he was playing here with uh, Bob Dylan some years, a couple of years back, in town. Mm. And I was going to go along, but something came up and I didn't even get to go to that, you know, so... I remember I met Philip, all right, I was, I remember I met him in the TV club. He was, a, in fact, he was going through a pretty rough period, you know, where yeah. things weren't going that well. Uh, you see, people forget that, you know, the insecurity. Again, he would have been living with that, not knowing if he was going to become, you know, if the success was going to last, yeah. or, you know. But I remember going up to the TV club after a show that I did somewhere else, and I met him, and he was in great form again, you know, but... uh it was just soon after that I heard about his his death, you know, which, again, it makes you think, you know, what's the point in uh, seeking fame if, if, you know. If this is what the result. Well, it, it is the result anyway, because, you see, there's nothing re there, really. You know, I mean, fame is just an illusion, you know. I mean, for, I mean all the Marlon Brando you know, Elvis, whoever. I mean, anybody that's seeking fame for fame's sake is insane, I think, basically. Yeah. It's the work. As the people come up to me, they always ask me, well, John, do you think you've made it yet? And I say, yeah, I made the last, the last song I wrote, I made it. Mm. And uh, I made that song. And each one, if you can keep coming up with them, uh, that's, that's making it. Making, the <laughs> I hear that expression, making it. What are the other things that you noticed that have been, I suppose, the sad points along the journey when you've uh, been uh, the, involved? One of the saddest things, it's just at the popping into my head, I was introduced to a fellow from Fleetwood Mac one time. He'd lost his job in the band because of all sorts of stuff that was mm. going on. But he taught me to show you how mad the music business can be, the, the whole rock business. 
he said, uh, instead of having his photographs up in, up in the mantelpiece in his house, he had photographs of all his cars. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's how twisted he became. You know, he had a family, he had a wife, but he said all he had up all over the place was photographs of, of uh, his Bentley, his Rolls Royce, his Jaguar, and he'd lost them all by this stage. All right. Uh, uh, and he was down on, you know, again, very volatile business, you know, it's anything can happen. Uh, and then another really sad one was I was in the company of a fellow who was trying to do a deal one time in a I had I was I wasn't into it. I gave up all that stuff years ago. But he was, and the fella who who was dealing to him said uh, a knock came to the door, and he went out and he came back and he said, uh, "Oh, that was uh, that was just uh, the wife of a well-known rock star. I won't mention the name, hmm. but she said uh, she's really on the skids now. She wanted to know would uh, I take her telev call her television and give her a line." said would i yeah yeah yeah. he was a cruel kind of man you know is there a lot of jealousy as well amongst kind of musicians trying to f get to the top oh yeah it's, it's it's that goes on in everything you know in all in all walks of life you know i mean it's not just in the music business i mean it's in the all the arts you, you know you get the jockeying for position hmm. again i would try my best to steer outside it uh and is it that you kind of lived that period for a while and you just said, no, this isn't well, for I, me? Well, I did. I got, I got a good taste of it uh, when I was very young, you know. When I was six, 17, I think we had a big hit and, you know, it was flying all over the place. And, and I remember one day actually being surrounded by people looking for my autograph, <laughs> funnily enough, in Dublin. I said, this is insane. You know? <laughs> and I said, this isn't for me. And uh, after that, then I kind of, began to divorce myself from that whole situation. Mm. Uh, it's mad as well because it, bands are used up to the hilt by record companies and, you know, they all they want to do is get their pound of flesh off, off them, you know. I love the way that it's developed, you know, where young bands or young songwriters can just work at home and, and do their own kind of stuff. They don't need companies anymore. Yeah, I, I think that's terrific. I remember being in one of the biggest record companies in London one time, and the guy said to me, one of the top A&R men, mm. and, and uh, he said, the only reason we're signing you, he said, is because we like to have one fairly decent uh, songwriter on our books. And I said, that's great, at, at least. He said, we wouldn't have any expectations like of you selling a lot, he said. But the way we work it, this was the time of punk. Mm. And he said... Well, I'll be going out tonight now and I'm going to see about 10 different punk bands and we're going to sign up. I know for a fact I'm going to sign three of them. Mm. And he said, it's like throwing shit at the wall. He said, some of it is going to stick, you know. <laughs> and I don't know from Adam whether they're good or bad or indifferent. He said, I know you're good, but you said you wouldn't sell that much. You know, you wouldn't, your songs aren't radio friendly. <laughs> Okay, well, we, we, we'll go to nowadays then when... Um this is the questionable thing, the depth of good songwriting and these reality TV shows, these X Factors on all Ireland talent shows and stuff like that. Uh, it's huge controversy. You know, it's, it's split people in, in half as to where they stand on it. You will be regarded as one of the best Irish songwriters. What would your opinion be on these reality TV shows? Well, I think they're saturated with them at the moment, aren't we? I know that my kids listen, watch them and, and I'm sucked into them sometimes because they're watching them. But it's, it's a bit like when we started out, all the bands started out in the same way. There was always talent contests going on. I mm. don't see anything wrong with talent contests. It's just the nature of them now. I mean, some of the, some of the fellas on, <laughs> judge, the judges seem to be very suspect, I think. Yeah. Know, because uh, not only are they very cruel, but, uh, I often wonder, do they know anything at all about what they're talking about? Some of them, you know, I mean, they haven't a clue, I don't think. They, they, but you see, the, the whole pop industry then is an industry, like it's, 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 it's divorced from, you know, what real music or real songs or poetry is about. Uh, they'll pull in and hallelujah at the end of something mm -hmm. just to, sh just pretend that they're, you know, they have a bit of knowledge, knowledge <laughs> on what's going on. And, but it's a strange world we live in. Uh, 
more and more fascinated by what goes on, you know. And but again, I I, I keep reminding myself that that's the way we started too, you know. I mean, mm. in fact, when we w- went to London, then we we were in another. I remember being lined up almost like a factory, you know, all these different acts, uh, and we had to wait there for hours and hours while all these record companies were were viewing us, you know. And luckily, we had we made an impression and we got picked, you know. And we were went in and did our demo session and then we had three or four big record companies looking looking at you, you know. But again, the way they tr- treat you is, is you know, I, I'd be very suspect of all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know? And then they try to change you. The minute they get you, they want to turn you into something that they have a concept of, you know. Which, yeah, you become a product. Yeah. I, I, There are certain, there were always certain labels that, you know, allowed you, you know, for artistic freedom, you know, and, and they genuinely spotted people. Labels like Island Records had a, had a good sus in that. In fact, they were interested in us as well, and our manager made the wrong decision, I think, you know, to, to go with uh, Decca, who was mm. much more a big corporate kind of... Uh, I remember arriving down at Decca the first day, and there was a butler outside with a big hat, <laughs> and he was, Jesus, I said, <laughs> come in, boys. <laughs> This is the Decca building. <laughs> and, and you go up to these offices and you, you sit around and these fellows that t- probably don't know their arse from their elbow about songs. You mm. know. It is a strange world we live in, but uh, you have to make the most of it. We'll go to 1989, a huge hit, The Voyage. And Christy Moore, of course, has covered that. And there's been statistics to say it's his most downloaded song on iTunes. It uh, is. As written by you, and it's a song that has probably cropped up in many an interview for you over the years, but it's a song that you can certainly, to this day, still stand by and be very proud of. Very much so. Uh, in fact, only last night I was out at my daughter's school out in New Inn, and uh, the theme of the graduation from, you know, they're all leaving the school now, and they're, there they were, all singing the voyage, <laughs> the whole the whole school. Brilliant. Thing which is lovely. You know? mm. And I've heard that uh, that's been done a few times. Uh, choirs have done, have done it, you know, versions. Probably the biggest seller of all has been uh, the Irish tenors. They did put it on an album. And it's been on low, countless albums. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it it's has. Been, it's been the bread and butter for me down the years. But um, it was just one of, I think, 17 or 18 songs that I wrote on the theme of uh, relationships, you know, within marriage. Uh, trying to bring up kids. Mm. There's lots of the songs related to that. In fact, the show I'm on the road doing now is is The Voyage. Uh, the first songs I wrote for Just Another Town, and I wrote them in my la- mid to late 20s. I was a late developer. May have lacked something in skill that I gained since then, you know, and I've applied to the, the songs on The Voyage. That doesn't mean that artistically they're not, you know, of the same value. Mm. In fact, they are. Uh, I remember reading Tolstoy one time, he said, uh, you know, he said, you can have something that's completely fake and if it's all dressed up, you know, with big production values and all this, you know, it'll fool people for a while and it does all the time, like it has down the centuries. Yeah, it has. Uh, it does all the time, if you on the radio especially, and then you go back and you listen more carefully and it doesn't have any lasting value. It's the lasting value. And I think that the, the songs in Just Other Town have that lasting value, mm. but I gained something then in applying a lot of time and effort to the skill of songwriting as well. And it, I re- it really began to blossom during them songs, I think, you know. And I had a deep love of literature ever since a young, a young girl turned me on to Franz Kafka when I was 17 or 18. Uh, and poetry, she gave me Brian Merriman's uh, book of uh, you know, he's a fellow Limerick man. She taught me it's a very bawdy book. You might like it. Mm. And <laughs> I, I actually stole a few lines from that for songs on the Granny's album. Mm. But ever since then, I've been studying poetry as much as listening to music, you know, okay. of all different kinds. And I, I, any advice I could give to other songwriters is to do that as well, like to, to actually take it as much interest in poetry as in music you know and you don't have to necessarily stay within the realm of you know popular music mm. because that's not going to fade anyway you know i mean and it's True. even while it's 
there, there mightn't be that much substance. At least time has done its work on the older stuff, you know. A melody, a good melody by Bach has lasted hundreds of years. So, you know, listen to that and you learn about how to construct melody, you know. Has there been any people that you've really enjoyed working with over the years? I've never got on with producers, so I ended up having to produce myself uh, because, again, I often felt, you know, it, it, it's a bit like an artist if he's painting a picture, if he had someone looking over his shoulder saying, no, don't do it like that, mm. do it this way, you know. I So I had to learn that as well, how to, to, to what I wanted in a studio, you yeah. know. And that's time consuming. Have I, I've enjoyed working with lots of musicians, you know. It's always nice to, to find good musicians to work with. And, you know, they, generally, there's good musicians in any locality you're in, like, mm. you know. There's fine musicians all over Galway, you know, that, that all you have to do is seek them out. And, yeah. uh, and I've done so, and I, and I really appreciate all the, the contribution they've made to my work down the years, you know. You've done, is it five albums all, all together? Well, it's very hard. I, you see, I, I don't look at uh, albums as being finished things. Right. You know, it's, uh, I, the only one I would is Just Another Town and possibly To the Light now. Mm. But I, I've been changing. And they'd be your more recent ones, would they? Well, you see, I've been working on all these songs simultaneously over the years. Like, okay. so I, I don't, they're not fixed entities like, uh, do you know what I mean? So most people would look at their album as a finished thing. Mm. I keep changing them and dropping songs and adding ones that I think are better, you know, just right. to improve the, the thing. But they, if you want to know exactly what I'm doing, you'd, I'd advise anyone to listen, to read To The Light. Because yes. There's four chapters in that. There's four song collections and that's the way it will end up. You know, there's still only before after all of it. I, any new songs I get will be added to them, if you know what I mean. And and for those who aren't familiar, last year you brought out a book which is called To The Light that you just uh, yeah. mentioned there. And it basically, it, it it gives the lyrics of the songs, but it also gives the history of them and where you came up with the ideas yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, for someone who is interested in songwriting or wants to challenge themselves as a songwriter, it gives them a great insight as well as to where ideas can come from. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I've kept a song journal for, for uh, must be 40 years now. And there's about 10 of them, I think, big, thick things mm. that I, any ideas I get, I jot them in it. And, and, and then you look back over and you'll see how the thing germinated and how it's, you know, progressed and then it's a good thing to do I would advise anybody to do it it's a great way of and any ideas you get you'll, you'll write a little poem or something like that and then suddenly if three months later it'll turn into a song you know and do you start off just writing lyrics or is it a well, mixture of music and lyrics no no I always I, I always get melodies for us but I'm constantly writing mm. every day like bits and pieces you know but the melodies is a separate thing I again I I, I think that melody and poetry are two separate things, you know. They're, uh, so you have to apply yourself to both. And then when they come together, when they work, which isn't very often, then that's the, a song. A song is kind of born. <laughs> well, Johnny, listen, thanks a million for joining us here in studio this afternoon. And as we were saying, To the Light is the book. And it's it's gotten a great reaction as well since it has come out in the last year, and it is highly recommended for everyone to get. And of course, there's there's loads of different releases that you've done, as you said, just not the town and to the light are probably your your two fixed albums, and you're playing as well in Thurlis on the fourth of June of this year, 2010, and you also have your own website as well, JohnnyDuton.com. That's it. So you're going to play uh, an acoustic will, song for us now. I've I've got lots of letters from people over the years but uh regarding my songs but none more moving than this one I I received there over a year ago it said uh, dear Johnny I just wanted to tell you how much your songs have blessed me and my family a few weeks back I got a call in Chicago to come home my mum had been rushed to hospital suddenly with liver failure as it turned out it was aggressive cancer Thank God we made it on time and spent her last few days sitting with her in Black Rock Hospice. On her last day, we sang her favourite songs. My dad requested that I sing The Voyage, a song I had played for them once when they danced. I sang it and he wept over her. He asked me to sing it again at her funeral and there wasn't a dry eye in the church. 
Mum went to be buried in the county where she was born, and on the night before her burial, my brother and I almost got into a fight. It was brought on by years of issues never addressed and came to a head with the pressure of Mum's death. I went home feeling horrible over the issue. My cousin Pat gave me your album, The Voyage, and I read the following lines taken from your song, In Our Father's Name. In the long shadow of our family tree that darkened once the heart in me, I found good reason to believe in our frail seed. These words gave me such a power to forgive the hurts and recognise my own frailties that I often ignore. So thanks for sharing your gift of songwriting with the world. It has been a huge blessing to me. I'm leaving for Texas tomorrow and I'm looking forward to listening to the full album on the long drive there. Your songs remind me of home, but I think they will also fit well with the cornfields of Illinois and the great wide open of Missouri. On my next trip home, I hope to catch up with one of your shows. P.S. Is the father supposed to be God or our dad's? of our family tree that darkened once the heart in me I found good reason to believe in our frail seed and in our children's eyes I watch it grow as I watched it once in the early glow Of my brother's and sister's eyes Before our broken ties Our roots run deep in sorrow And will hurt as much tomorrow We don't try to end the blame Restore peace in our Father's name Its branches lean together on high In the clear blue sky Our roots run deep in sorrow And will hurt as much tomorrow If we don't try to end the blame Restore peace in our Father's name In our frail seed 